engineering achievements extended far beyond the city walls. Its intricately designed and constructed water and drainage system were unrivaled anywhere. Before the actual soil was placed in, first, Darius's engineers constructed a drainage system, plumbing, drain pipes. These would be covered. Water was also brought in along the Kanat system. But then those drain pipes, which would drain the effluents out, those were taken underground below the surface where the visitor would never see that. Even during his most ambitious projects to enhance the empire's monuments and infrastructure, Darius never stopped expanding his empire. Under the brilliant leadership of Darius, the Persian Empire grew to staggering size. It included modern Iran and Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, Armenia, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, parts of Central Asia, all the way to northern India. And man, this is a lot of turf. To connect the farthest reaches of the empire, Darius would launch two audacious building projects. One would stretch over 1,500 miles of the Persian Empire. The other would connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Creating gardens was held in such high esteem that the Persian kings wished to be remembered as gardeners. Under the rule of Darius the Great, the Persian Empire grew to staggering proportions. Now he wanted to consolidate and connect the far-flung parts of his great kingdom. 515 BC, Darius orders his engineers to build a massive stone highway, one that would weave the empire together from North Africa to India. Extending over 1,500 miles of the empire, he would call it the Royal Road. This was quite the engineering feat because this had to traverse through mountains, forests, deserts. So typically, earth would be packed, hardened, for example. They may not have had, had uh, asphalt, but they certainly had knowledge of uh, packing gravel or tiny rocks. Laying down a stone road is vital in a terrain where there could be a high water table. You don't want to get your feet stuck in the mud. You don't want to get your cart stuck in the mud. So you have to raise the road surface up. That means laying down some kind of surface initially that will either absorb the groundwater or not allow the groundwater to uh, displace the road. The Royal Road was linked by 111 rest stations and inns every 18 miles, where travelers could eat, sleep, and switch to fresh horses. To ensure safety, watchmen were posted all along its great length. Now, I'm going to talk with my friend, Dr. Lloyd Llewellyn Jones from the University of Edinburgh, professor of ancient history. I got to ask you this. Was it that safe? Essentially, yeah. I think what uh, uh, Darius, or Darius, if you will, manages to do here is uh, an incredible feat. I mean, we're standing here in Turkey, okay? Right. And we could take one route straight the way through into central Iran. I mean, that's pretty good going. How fast? Okay, so if we're on horseback and uh, we're riding from one of these little garrisons to garrison every 15 miles, changing fresh horses, we can do that in about six, seven days, maybe. Six, six or days. seven days. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you could send messages on this road, mm -hmm. friends yeah, next, next city? Most definitely, and you know, and for trade, it, it's a godsend, as you can imagine. And this, this road cut through so much stuff. I mean, it just doesn't follow, you know, a, a formal pathway. It has to cross rivers, so it crosses the Tigris, it crosses by the ferry, river, by, right? by ferry, right. Uh, sometimes it clings to the side of mountains, sometimes it clings to the side of rivers, so the terrain is changeable. It's not drained or anything like that, so it's, it's not as advanced as some of the Roman roads we get right. later periods. So it doesn't have a gutter system? No, right nothing, like that, exactly. nothing like that. But what it's essentially is, it's uh, sort of maybe 20 feet wide uh, with a sort of chip-in base, which is good for horse treads and sure. that kind of stuff, you know? And which carriages really, and Exactly, to carries. get things through as quickly as you can, basically. Well, Lloyd, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thank you for enlightening us about this incredible road. But Darius still wasn't through. There was one territory Darius had yet to firmly control the vast riches of North Africa, and he was determined to build a gateway there. He had his engineers devise a giant canal linking the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. 
Everyone has heard of the Suez Canal, but how many have heard of Darius's Canal? What Darius did was build an east-west canal that was 130 miles long. With the Persian knowledge of hydrology, Darius's engineers used digging tools made of bronze and iron to first open the canal, then clear any blown sand and line it with stone ready for his ships to sail. It would take seven years to complete the 130 mile long waterway with a massive labor force of Egyptian stone cutters and canal builders. Parts of the canal between the Nile and the Red Sea were, were actually not waterways but just points along which the, the ships could be dragged uh, until they reached uh, another deeper portion where they could again sail their course. Darius says, I, Darius, king of kings, conqueror of Egypt, built this canal. He connected the Red Sea to the Nile River for trade, and he says, and ships were brought along my canal. By 500 BC, Persia was the largest empire the world had ever seen, even exceeding the size and wealth of Rome at its height four centuries later. Persia was invincible, and its appetite for conquest was beginning to frighten an emerging power across the Mediterranean, the city-states of Greece. Just a little geographical info. That big body of water out there is the Black Sea. This thin body of water here is the Bosphorus Strait that connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. So I'm standing in Asia, or Asia Minor, if you will, and that land over there is Europe. Now, in 494 BC, Darius put down a revolt from some cities on the coast of Turkey. But this revolt had been supported by Athens, so Darius wanted to teach Athens a lesson. He was going to march on Greece and attack that city. But how is he going to do it? He's got to go across the sea. Well, he takes a bridge of boats, pontoons, if you will, and lines them up from that point to that point and marches an army, so Herodotus says, of 70,000 men across the sea to attack Greece. Amazing. Persian engineers connected one side of the Bosporus to the other by scuttling boats side by side to form the foundation. Then they built a highway across the top, linking Asia to Europe. Probably this was a system of planks, and underneath there was a system of packed earth, or perhaps dry wood, to keep basically the road stable. Now, to keep the ships from wobbling, they must have used an anchor system of a certain weight because if the anchor would have been too heavy, that would have, of course, tilted or damaged the ships. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. That's quite the feat of engineering before the age of computers. It is late August in the year 490 BC. Darius has already marched into Greece and taken Macedonia. Now he's destined to meet the Greek general Themistocles and an army from Athens and Corinth at the famous Battle of Marathon. A massive army from Persia numbers 60,000 or 140,000, 250,000, depending upon the propaganda you read. Suffice it to say, the Greeks are outnumbered 10 to 1. Their only recourse is to send for reinforcements. So the legendary runner Philippides runs from Marathon to Sparta, a distance of 140 miles in two days, hence the name of the race, Marathon. The two armies faced each other separated by a vast open plain. If they clashed head-on, the massive Persian forces would mow down the greatly outnumbered Greeks. This was the beginning of the Persian Wars. A reduced Greek force attacked the Persians head-on. The Persians went for an easy kill. 